Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Grace. I'm here presenting my and Dr. Fouad Kashmir's work on um, feature engineering for U.S. state legislative hearings, stance, affiliation, engagement, and absentees. Um, so our presentation is kind of split into three main sections. Um, first, we work on extracting organizational affiliation from public comments in the California state legislature. And then we work on determining the opinion of uh, public commenters in the same um, legislature. And then we also um, close off with a discussion on evaluating legislator engagement in the proceedings. So to motivate this work, um, there's been a big issue recently um, over the last decade or so in the US with um, Google really hurting local news. You know, traditionally people would go buy newspapers and they'd read them in the morning and that was um, really helping to fund a lot of super vital um, journalistic research. The problem recently is that, you know, with the rise of Google and you can read everything on your phone, no one really buys newspapers anymore, right? And the downside of this is that it kills local news budgets, and so they're not spending um, as much to really fund reporters. And one of the big jobs of reporters um, is obviously to report, but specifically for local news is they focus on state legislatures. Now these are vital to the U.S. government, there's obviously the national legislature, there's, you know, the president, but um, Actually, the state legislatures have a lot larger impact in their specific state, um, which is kind of a huge deal for a place like California. It's the fifth largest economy um, in the world, and it has a population of around 40 million. And so the reduction um, in this coverage is really impactful and, and potentially harmful to um, you know, the government as a whole. Um, and so one of the causes of this smaller budget is that there's fewer reporters, and so they're not able to cover um, events as closely. Um, previously, you'd have a reporter in most hearings that would be taking notes and um, watching everything, and unfortunately, that's just not really possible anymore um, because of this reduction in budget. So it makes it much harder for them to track the day-to-day -day proceedings. Um, so this kind of inspired the creation of AI for Reporters, which this work is kind of a subset of. Um, and so that starts by automating the transcription of U.S. state legislative proceedings. Um, it turns out that in the legislatures, they won't actually transcribe anything, and they generally don't write very much down. Um, but they do post videos of all of the hearings. And so the first thing that AF Reporters does is create an automated transcription of the legislative proceedings. And then using that, we want to extract key facts from the proceedings. You know, this is everything from what bill was presented, um, what information was talked about, who talked, um, really anything that a reporter would be able to see um, sitting in a hearing, we want to give to them so that they're able to focus on the really impactful and important investigative, um, important investigative reporting. Excuse me. Um, so the goal here is to reduce the need for reporters to sit at hearings and instead empower them and enable them to really go after these you know, super important reporting work that they do instead of just having to take notes all the time. Um, and so this is achieved by creating tip sheets, which you can see over on the um, right there. And so this uses that transcribed audio recordings I mentioned previously to extract the facts. And then we can um, put these fact sheets um, online and make them available for reporters. So again, instead of having to sit in on a hearing, they're able to just go over this tip sheet really quickly and get leads and get ideas for what to investigate further. And so all of the work here is going to be incorporated into these tip sheets to make it much easier for reporters to kind of get the day-to-day -day understanding of what's actually going on and still letting them do the actual important work of, you know, investigating and, and writing for the public to um, understand what's happening in their legislatures. And ultimately, we want to be able to highlight the key facts and unusual aspects of the hearings to kind of suggest to reporters um, things that would be interesting for a follow-up. So to kind of talk about what the structure of the California and more generally U.S. state legislative hearings look like. So um, generally speaking, one of the legislators will come up with a great idea for a bill that's going to be able to, you know, change some law. Um, they'll write that bill and then the bill will get assigned to um, a committee hearing. So first the author will present a bill, um, talk through kind of the pros and cons of it and what, what they're trying to do. Um, and then an expert will give testimony on the bill. These can be anything from concerned citizens, lobbyists, um, academics, um, and then they'll get questioned by the legislators um, to kind of give the legislators a better idea of what's kind of gonna be in, um, impacted by the um, bill in question. And then um, the really interesting part of the state legislative hearings for us is that the committee will open that up to um, anyone to go and give comment. And this is important, number one, because it's the only time in this process where you know, a concerned citizen is able to come up and speak directly to the legislators about the issues um, 
that are going on. And it's also important because it's right before the um, committee votes on the bill. And the um, unfortunate part of the public comments is these aren't currently captured um, really in any way outside of the transcriptions. No one's there looking at who's actually um, giving a comment, what organizations are giving comments. And so these are really interesting to us because they have such an impact on the um, hearing proceedings. So when giving a public comment, there's um, a few different categories. The first one is a lobbyist, um, which you can see in the first example. These are representing an organization, and this is actually kind of um, an implicit way that um, you know, a lobbyist or some sort of um, concerned party is able to um, have a direct impact on the legislation that governs them. So this is obviously really important to understand. Um, the next type of comment is someone who is just representing themselves. These are generally concerned citizens that are, you know, passionate about a bill and are coming up to give their opinion. And then last but not least, you have a lot of comments that are, you know, somewhere in between. People can obviously say basically anything in these public comments, and so we have to be aware of this as well, that there's a lot of variation in, in what these comments are, are saying. Um, but the one thing we really wanted to drill down on is the way that these public comments are used to lobby the legislatures. Um, organizations obviously are very concerned with the legislation that's going to be regulating them, and so they have kind of a vested interest in making sure that, um, that, org that um, legislation benefits them financially. Um, and the problem here is that most of this lobbying isn't done in a way that the public can see. Generally, it's behind closed doors. Organizations are a little bit shy about this because um, you know, they don't want a big, splashy um, news article written about them, so they don't make it known. But they'll oftentimes go to a hearing and give a public comment in support or opposition. And so at that time, we're actually able to get a very interesting insight into how these public comments are being used to lobby the legislature and what's kind of going on behind the scenes. And so ultimately, we want to gain insight into what organizations are using public comments to influence legislation, because that gives us a really good idea of what's going on behind the scenes and behind closed doors. Um, so to do this, we're using a technique called named entity recognition. Really quickly, for those who aren't familiar with it, the goal here is to take a, a sentence or a paragraph or any amount of text and extract um, the different categories of um, nouns that are mentioned. Um, generally, they all go with um, organization, so here you can see that's the California State Assembly, um, people like Robert Riveras, and um, locations. And so the interesting part of the challenge here is that all three of those can actually be considered organizations, and we want to be able to find all of these affiliated organizations in the public comments. So um, at the top you can see someone who's representing the cities of um, Santa Ana, Oakland, and Tulare, um, the problem here is people are obviously from these cities as well, and so we want to make sure that our system is able to differentiate between people who live in the cities and um, representatives of the government of those cities. The next category is, is a little bit easier. These are traditional organizations that are acting as affiliated organizations, so we want to make sure that we cover that as well. And um, in the third example, we can see someone representing an organization named after themselves. And again, this is a challenge for traditional um, NER methods as you know, this is a name, and we actually want to make sure that that's extracted as a um, organization. And last but not least, at the bottom, we have someone that has no affiliation, and obviously in that case, we want to make sure that we're, you know, not spreading false information. There we go. Um, so as I mentioned previously, we want to make sure that the NER models are only identifying the affiliated organizations. And so the way that we did this is we went through a um, corpus of about 700 um, public comments from um, uh, the AI for Reporters um, database, and then we create a, um, a large set of manually annotated public comments. You can see that at the bottom. Um, we go through and we identify where each organization is and what the organization name is. And then using that, we augment the data further with a um, list of around 15,000 um, registered organizations that are lobbyists with the California State Legislature. And so that gives us a, a fairly large set of data which we can fine tune the existing um, NER models on to give us um, a really effective custom solution. So we've um, considered a, a wide range of different models. Um, the two that we found worked best were the Stanford NER model presented by Finkel et al. and the Spacey NER model presented by Hannibal et al. And the problem here is that because we're kind of pushing the traditional definition of um, NER um, to really be able to um, consider a wide range of things organizations, a lot of these models kind of struggle um, to do it effectively. 
But what we found is that the um, Stanford NER model, we call it here the white acceptance model, is able to really consistently tag a high percentage of the reference affiliates. The problem though is it captures um, more than just that and it'll, it's um, much more likely to be wrong and to actually capture an organization that isn't referenced as an affiliate or something else like that. So it's not an ideal uh, method in and of itself. Conversely, the spacey NER model is very likely to capture the true affiliates, but it doesn't capture all of them. And so again, the problem here is that it's not possible with the current generation of NER models to kind of get a single model that can do it all. But luckily we were able to find these two models that kind of have complementing pros and cons. So what we ended up doing is combining these models with a set of hand-coded rules, and these were able to fairly effectively um, identify affiliated organizations within public comments. So um, to walk through it, first we um, take the comment text and we, um, we annotate it with the wide acceptance model and the high certainty model. And then we also do a text search for the known organizations. Again, these are any organizations that are previously registered um, with the California State Legislature. Um, we then check if the organization is present in both of these models. If it is, it goes into the outputted set of affiliated organizations. Um, after doing a little bit of manual analysis of the public comments, we noticed um, kind of three features that are common between most of these, because public comments are a fairly important, like, stylistic, and they, they're generally very consistent in the way that they're um, said, um, especially for the, um, the organizational affiliates that we're mentioning here. Um, so if the organization is within the first 12 words, and the organization does not match the speaker's name, and it's detected um, as an organization in a test sentence tagged by our, one of our NER models, then it's also added to the affiliated organizations. So to evaluate model performance, we looked at um, the two um, vanilla models and then our combined model as well. And what we show here is um, from the scores alone, you can see that the combined model is much more effective. But what isn't shown here and we take as a really positive um, indication is that when the combined model is wrong, it's wrong in you know, a non-harmful um, or non-mistruthful way. Um, so generally it'll only get like part of, um, part of the organization. So for example, like the Boys and Girls Club, um, perhaps it'll only get the Girls Club part of the organization. So again, it's not really spreading false information. It's just um, a little bit wrong. So again, we took that as a definite positive for the combined model in that it was, um, you know, when it was wrong, it was wrong in a, a much less um, disinformation way. Um, and so we use this model to um, evaluate the organizations that were most frequently using public comments to lobby the California State Legislature between 2017 and 2018. And this really highlights one of the big advantages of our model is we're able to take, um, despite the large number of hearings that a reporter would have to sit in and, you know, spend time away from, you know, doing actual investigative work, we're able to kind of automate this um, across a large scale of um, legislative discussion. And so um, this really gives us insight into how organizations influence legislation over time and what organizations are frequently using public comments to try to lobby the state legislature. So over on the right, we can see the list um, from top to bottom of the um, 10 um, excuse me, organizations that are most frequently lobbying the state legislature. So moving on from that, we wanted to look as well at um, determining the commenter opinion. Obviously, if someone's gonna spend their time to drive out to Sacramento, which is potentially a multi-hour long um, you know, commute for someone, they're gonna have an opinion on the bill, and we wanna make sure that we understand that as well. So at the top, we can see someone that's um, supporting the bill. In the middle are two people that are neutral. It's relatively frequent for an organization that's actively working with the um, legislature to not support the bill yet, but upon amendment, um, they would change their opinion, and so we want to make sure that we're tagging that as neutral, even though that's subject to change at a later hearing. And last but not least, we have someone that's opposing the bill. So again, um, because the uh, public comments are fairly formulaic, there's a specific set of words that people use to indicate either their support or their opposition to a given bill. And so we're able to use a keyword search to um, uh, determine their opinion. So we separate it into five different categories, strong opposition, strong support. This is explicitly saying that they, um, their opinion, um, medium opposition and support. People will frequently say like, hey, I really think that you should vote yes or no. And while they may not be explicitly supporting the bill, they're still trying to lobby a, legislature, a legislator to vote in a specific way. And so we capture that as well. Last but not least, we find um, co-sponsors as well. Surprisingly, in the um, US system, co-sponsor is actually not that strong 
um, of a word. People frequently co-sponsor bills for different political reasons. I mean, literally without even reading the um, bill text itself, which is quite surprising. And so we um, consider that weak support as well. So we'll count the occurrences of each of um, each of the category words in a given um, public comment, and then we run that with a decision tree model to determine the support, opposition, or neutrality on a given bill. And we find that this works pretty well um, across that same set of um, 693 manually tagged comments, and then testing it on 193, you find an F1 score of um, 0.978, which is pretty high. Um, below, you can see um, a couple more example public comments and the um, outputted opinion of the bill by our model. And so as you can see, it's, it's relatively robust and, and we take that as a very positive um, sign. We also looked at legislator engagement. So this is vital because representatives are the voice of the people in the government, right? It's really important that they're doing their jobs because ultimately they are representing the citizens that voted for them and they're the voice of the government. And so we wanna make sure that they're engaged and actually you know, not skipping out on proceedings that actually happens surprisingly frequently, and this is something that a reporter would very easily be able to pick up on while they're sitting in on a hearing. But again, as reporters have less money and they're not able to spend the time um, sitting in a hearing, even though they would want to in a, an ideal world, we're able to capture that in an automated way. Um, so there's four factors that we identified as um, representing legislator engagement, and these were determined um, in concert with um, some experts from the state legislature um, voting, which obviously they're you know, saying how they um, vote on a bill, the number of times they're speaking in a hearing, the number of back and forth they have with non-legislators. These are frequently having a discussion with an expert or something, and this is obviously a sign that they're actively trying to gain more information. And last but not least, asking questions of other people during the um, proceedings. And so we develop um, these equations um, that are presented above. These are um, calculated across the entire legislative session. Um, the vote score is um, the number of times that they voted divided by the number of opportunities they have to vote. And so this is a rough proxy for um, whether or not they were a given legislator was at the end of the um, hearing. And then we, um, uh, weight each of these factors as well, and so this just gives us a good idea of, you know, kind of broadly speaking, how engaged they were over a, um, a given two-year period, and then we sum each of those scores to present the um, overall engagement score for a given legislator. Um, with this, we find the uh, most and the least engaged legislators. Um, Hannah Beth Jackson is like a well-known powerhouse in the state legislator, legislature, excuse me. And so the fact that she's top there is number one, not at all surprising, and number two, um, a positive sign that shows that um, our engagement scores are doing what we expect. We also can find the um, least engaged legislators, which is, I think, a little bit more useful for reporters. Um, this is excluding any legislators that aren't present for a full session. Frequently, you'll have um, legislators who get sick or have to resign for some reason, and then there'll be a runoff. And we want to make sure that we're not, you know, unfairly penalizing any legislators that came late to the, um, to the session, and we're able to give a good idea of the overall engagement of a given legislature. Um, we also track legislator absenteeism. And so again, this is, um, even though a legislator is representing the people and really should be in a hearing to actually be able to do their job, frequently you'll find legislators that are either meeting with people or they just can't be bothered to attend a hearing for whatever um, reason. And so we wanna make sure that we're tracking that as well. And so the key insight here is that during a hearing, the committee secretary will call a legislator's name to request and record their vote. Um, this is actually like a requirement to be able to um, record the vote. You can't just do it um, without speaking. And so if a legislator um, doesn't respond with their vote, that's a very strong indication that they um, weren't present. But also, if the legislator doesn't speak at all during the session and isn't referenced by another committee member, then we can be with a very high um, level of certainty, say that the legislator was um, absent from a given hearing. And again, there's a lot of special sessions that'll occur in the state legislature, whether that be um, a full legislative hearing or um, session, excuse me, where not everyone is expected to speak. And there's also um, a couple other special cases. We don't consider those. So we're only looking at times where a legislator would be expected to be present and engaged and you know, voting during a given hearing. So with that, um, just to kind of recap everything we went over, we demonstrated the extraction of affiliated um, 
um, organizations from public comments in the state legislature. We tracked the position of commenters on bills, and we also introduced metrics for legislator engagement and absenteeism, giving the general public greater insight into the, um, you know, how effective essentially their representatives are. So with that, I can take any questions you all might have. <laughs>